what happens is that the ionosphere in some regions presents uh, a load that is not uniform. I mean, if, if for example, you put in a uniform conductivity everywhere, um, everything's nice and symmetric. If you have symmetric solar wind conditions and so on, the sex line's nice and symmetric. As soon as you put in a non-uniform conductivity, the, the, the X line on the night side starts to move around to different places. And we think that the reason is that the load, that the differences in conductivity demand different loads. Um, sigma P E squared, um, it, it's a very complicated nonlinear relationship. And so the reconnection process, particularly on the night side, adjusts itself to accommodate the load that the ionosphere is demanding. But they have to shake hands. It's not like reconnection, I'm going to happen, ionosphere, you deal with it. Uh, ionosphere, I'm a load. Reconnection, you give me some power. They have to shake hands. It's not just one, there's not a dog and a tail here in, in, in magnetosphere ionosphere coupling. It, Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yes, yes, right. It's true. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I want to say a, some more in the persistent features, <clears throat> but there's one place where I have a little bit of uh, hedge room here. Um, so um, I, I think I'd be derelict if I didn't say something about co-rotation in the plasma sphere. So the Earth rotates, and as the Earth rotates, the neutrals, because they're collisional, rotate, the atmosphere rotates with the Earth. Those rotating neutral particles collide with ions, that are in the ionosphere, the, the ionized part of the upper atmosphere, and they start co-rotating. And what happens when you have an ion or an uh, ionized gas moving perpendicular to the magnetic field? There must be an electric field associated with that. And that electric field is projected, uh, well, one way to think about it is that the electric field is projected out into uh, the equatorial region of the magnetosphere. It's a good thing Vesely Unis isn't in this audience. Uh, it, it just would go nonlinear uh, to talk about electric fields communicating this information. But um, so, at any rate, there's an electric field, and the simplest way to understand the plasma sphere and the so-called plasma pause, the transition from this dense cold plasma that's mainly fed by the ionosphere moving out along field lines, and the magnetosphere is to uh, consider a convection electric field which is uniform, pointing dawn to dusk in this figure. So everywhere the electric field points from up to down for simplicity. Um, and that's the nominal direction of the electric field, the convection electric field in the magnetosphere, although it's more complicated in space than that. And then if we take a simple co-rotation electric field, where uh, so, so if the electric field points inward, Remember, this is dawn, this is dusk. If the electric field points inward and you cross that electric field into the magnetic field, then that gives a rotation uh, in, this, in this way right here. Dawn, dusk, like that. And now, if I superpose these two electric fields or, or the potentials that are associated with them, I get a pattern that looks like this. And this boundary between co-rotating plasma and convecting plasma, which is going to go out and hit the magnetopause, is called is essentially the plasma pause. So to first approximation, that determines where the plasma pause is. And it's, uh, you know, for kind of nominal conditions at about four Earth radius from Earth. So inside of that, the fluid, the, the, the material is co-rotating, and it's, and it's mainly of ionospheric origin. And outside of that, uh, the fluid is come, the particles are coming from out here in the tail and flowing earthward. And then, of course, that boundary is highly variable. As you crank up the, uh, uh, the driving of the system, the convection electric field intensifies, and the plasma pause moves earthward. 
as, you, as, as, as the uh, driving subsides, the plasma pause moves out, and it can go way out uh, under very quiet conditions. And it, the plasma sphere has been imaged. Uh, this is an image from the image satellite in EUV. I think this is from uh, resonantly scattered uh, helium emissions. So photons come in, uh, absorbed by helium, and then helium re-radiates, and then that's what they image uh, with this imager. And you can see the day side is over here to the left. Uh, this bright line here is the intense EUV emissions from, uh, from uh, day side luminosity. But this is looking at high altitude down toward the equatorial plane, and so you can actually get an image of the, of the plasmosphere that way. Of course, one has to be very careful here because the plasmosphere is dominantly protons, not helium. So you can say there's a helium plasmosphere and there's a proton plasmosphere, and they may not be exactly the same. And in fact, when a satellite flies through and you measure the, the helium and the, and the protons, uh, they, they have somewhat different profiles. OK. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think I will uh, try, to, try to get ahead of things here. Um, I had a number of plots to show you some more Weimar patterns and how things vary. I, I would like to say something about uh, Carl's uh, question about, you know, it's not just due south IMF, what happens when there's another component. And so what you see here is a situation where there's a Y component to the IMF, 45 degrees in this case. And uh, the magnetic reconnection process doesn't occur right in the equatorial plane. It occurs at, at uh, higher latitudes. Um, and one consequence of that is that after reconnection occurs, the field lines are not only drug over the top, but they're pulled around to the sides. And so you get a very, and then mind you, these field lines are anchored in the ionosphere or down in the ionosphere. And so as the solar wind pulls those field lines, as the tangential stresses are exerted on those field lines, and they exert a, a force on the fluid in the ionosphere, the fluid has to respond to that fact that the field lines are being pulled uh, left and right here. And so the whole ionospheric convection pattern changes. Again, these are Weimar patterns. Now, rather than showing color and field line current, the color and the contours are both uh, equal potentials. Um, and um, one thing um, I would like to point out here is uh, kind of a question I don't think people have really asked themselves until we, we got involved in this uh, several years ago. One of my students did. But the potential is almost always more magnitude is always larger. It's negative, but its magnitude is almost always larger in the dusk cell than the dawn cell. What is that telling us? Well, what it's telling us is that more magnet. Remember, these, this fluid has got field lines tied to it. And so it means more magnetic flux is circulating in the dusk cell than the dawn cell. That's, if there's a difference in the magnitude, it means there are more equal potentials that are blue than there are red here. And so more flux, what does that mean? How does, it, how does that manifest itself into the, in, in the magnetosphere? And this comes back to Carl's question about non-uniformity and how the ionosphere influences it. So let me go away from this. And so to, to give you some insights in, into uh, some of the things, and we don't fully understand uh, all the causality here, but if you, if you do a global simulation, um, and you put in a uniform conductance everywhere. So in color here, this is Hall conductance. These are equal potential flow streamlines in the ionosphere. Um, this is the X line in the equatorial magnetosphere. The, the dash part of it means the uh, reconnection rate is, is, is very low there. Um, so essentially, you have reconnection occurring on the day side here and on the night side here, and not much uh, in the dashed region. Um, these region, the color here are, uh, represent the magnitude of the flow velocity coming earthward, so the exhaust jets from reconnection. So basically, in this picture, uh, the magnetic field lines are being forced to the equatorial plane from the lobes of the magnetosphere. That magnetic energy is being converted into fluid energy, and that fluid energy goes shooting out as exhaust jets from the reconnection site. And these are earthward exhaust jets, and they're carrying flux earthward, magnetic flux earthward. And it slows down as you get, you 
becomes very slow as you get into the inner region here. Um, and things are more or less symmetric. Um, nothing is, actually these are one hour average states after a time history in the simulation that looks like this, where this is the southward, this is due southward IMF. There's no asymmetry in the solar wind here. Two hours south, five nanotesla. Two hours north, five nano, four nanotesla, sorry. And then four, four hours south, four nanotesla. And then this is one hour average at the end to knock down some of the variability that uh, is inherent in the night side here. More or less symmetric for uniform conductance. Now, we turn on the empirical uh, precipitation model, which, in, which gives a, an auroral uh, conductance distribution that you see here, somewhat non-uniform. And then this, of course, is the dayside UV. That's photoionization. No question. I thought there was a question there. And so we have a very non-uniform Hall conductance now. And one thing that we see is that now the fast flows and the reconnection rates different. More re faster reconnection occurring on the uh, dusk side than the dawn side here. And in fact, oh, it's probably been about 10 years now I was at Berkeley talking to Tai Fan, who's a reconnection guru there. And I was telling him about some of these early results that we had uh, developed. And he said, you know, we, uh, we see that. We've been seeing this in the magneto tail for like 20 years and nobody knows, you know, there are all these various explanations, but nobody's really had an explanation for why that occurs. And, um, and I said, well, I think, you know, this must, must have something to do with it. And he, his, his comment was, you know, I can't imagine, or I couldn't have imagined that the ionosphere could tell the magnetosphere how to reconnect. <laughs> There's a little bit of chauvinism in this field about who's the dog and who's the tail, but they really have to shake hands. Uh, to get it right. And then we do something which nature won't do for you. We just dug a hole where the auroral conductance would be enhanced. No EUV here. We just deep, artificially depleted the conductance to see what it would do. And it moved the enhanced reconnection to the other side. And it, it turns out it's all about the Hall conductance. You can put in, if you put in uniform Hall conductance and highly structured Pedersen conductance, it won't do this. It's a very interesting result. Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip this. Jan would probably like it if I talked more about this, but um, I, I'd like to say something about dynamics and we're running out of time. Um, another, let me just say briefly, another very important part of the magnetosphere ionosphere interaction is the exchange of mass. And one way to think about what happens at a very simple level is that the magnetosphere has the capacity to dump all of this electromagnetic power into the upper atmosphere and, and, and ionosphere. And the ionosphere gets exercised and it starts sending mass back out. And what's interesting and why it's important is that when we put, and we have some very imperfect models now for how to get mass out of the ionosphere into the magnetosphere, but almost anything we do has a dramatic effect on the, on the dynamics of the magnetosphere. And I'll show you some results of with and without to give you a sense of how important that is. So um, you can study these slides if, if you have the interest. Um, two, the two main processes for getting mass out of the ionosphere are the polar wind, which is very similar to the solar wind, the origin of the solar wind, which I hope you've heard about. And, um, and so that's the classical polar wind that's was first studied. And then the other process, which is quite, quite a bit more complicated and which we have no good models for, is uh, associated with wave particle interactions. So a lot of turbulence in the electric field in particular develops at low altitudes. And um, the perpendicular electric field, when it develops structure smaller than the ion gyro radius, breaks that adiabatic invariance. The ions start accelerating in the direction of those turbulent electric fields. Their adiabatic invariant increases, the mirror force lifts them out. And um, the ions with the largest Larmor radius are the oxygen, so they're the first to go. So they're the ones that are mostly affected by those processes. Okay, um, activity and dynamics. Has anybody earlier this week shown this animation? Okay, so in one sense, it's not very hard to understand. The, the sun has a, uh, ejects a lot of mass, uh, ionized, heads earthward, interacts with Earth's magnetic field. 
um, compresses the day side, enhances reconnection. Change if you enhance the reconnection rate, you, you put more dynamic energy from the solar wind into the magnetosphere, and then um, um, that energizes geospace, um, the magnetosphere, and the ionosphere, and and the thermosphere, the neutral gas at, at low altitudes. And what you see here, and, and I just want to play this, uh, let this go through one more time. Um, so you see this, this reconnection that, that emerges on the night side, and that process is very dynamic, much more dynamic than the day side. The day side will be dynamic if the solar wind's dynamic. If the solar wind's steady, the day side will be more or less steady. All of the, the real dynamics occurs over on the night side. And I'm going to take you uh, quickly through um, some uh, associations of activity with solar cycle variability. John, are you? How much of this stuff are you going to talk about? Okay, so I'll go through it very quickly. It's it's okay to hear about things twice. Um, so this is the solar record going back to 1600 of sunspots, uh, with some uncertain fidelity. The further back you go back in time, as to what exactly the number is. But what I've superposed on here are the really the super, super storms as measured by DST, and I'll talk about DST in a bit. Um, so uh, the red line here is the magnitude in nano Tesla. So DST, actually, why don't I talk about it right now? So remember the ring current. Remember the ring current produces a magnetic field that opposes the geomagnetic field. And if you put a magnetometer on the surface of the Earth near the equ equator, then when the ring current intensifies, it reduces the geomagnetic field there. That's, that's a measure. That, that d measure of that reduction in the magnetic field is called DST, disturbed storm time uh, deflection. So these are DST values going up to more than 1,600. And these are the largest storms. I, I think these are greater than 400 um, over this period of time that were known. Uh, not much, much was known until Humboldt, uh, von Humboldt discovers geomagnetic storms around the uh, turn of the 1800s. And then after that, there starts to be a record. Um, there's one uh, massive CME that missed Earth, and there are some estimates of, of its value here. How do we know that it could have that value if it missed Earth, if it didn't go to Earth? How, how would we know that? Uh, because we now have the stereo satellites, or had them. And so um, this. These pictures are from WSA Enlil at uh, SWPSI, uh, Space Weather Prediction Center. And so Stereo B, uh, uh, Stereo A was sitting out here and it saw this thing coming. Of course, Earth is here, so it, uh, the CME went off and completely missed Earth. But had it, had it gone to Earth, it, it might have been uh, uh, something like one of these storms uh, earlier in time. OK, now if we lower that threshold on DST and ask for all the events of storms with DST uh, less than minus 200 nanotesla, we get better statistics and we start to see other patterns. We see, um, so this is in the, the kind of the space era here. And uh, we see that one, um, they tend to cluster in the declining phase, the solar maximum and the declining phase of the, uh, of the solar cycle. Um, and then um, a real curious effect, uh, geomagnetic and KP is another measure of uh, geomagnetic activity based on magnetometers sitting on the surface of the Earth. And we see that magnetic activity statistically uh, tends to uh, KP from zero would be very quiet and KP eight or nine would be a giant event. And we see that um, uh, magnetic activity tends to cluster around the equinoxes. Kind of, kind of interesting. Um, so what happens around the equinoxes? Well, you ask, you know, what the, the, uh, the uh, geographic axis is tilted, kind of perpendicular uh, to the Sun-Earth line. And, um, and, and the dipole is offset from that, and it's rotating around that point. And, um, and it turns out that the, uh, um, the magnetic field in the interplanetary medium tends to have a component that is anti-parallel to that direction of the magnetic field when it points that way. That's called the russell mcferrin effect. It's not the entire effect, but it's part of, part of the reason why uh, you see this clustering near the equinox. Uh, 
And then uh, we're in an extended period of weak solar activity. Uh, the geomagnetic storms have been quite weak uh, during this period, and some people are asking themselves, what's wrong? <laughs> Something wrong here. Well, of course, nothing's wrong. It's just the way the sun is. But. OK, um, I'm, I'm going to go through these uh, next ones quickly. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of jargon with these indices, and it's, it's good at least to have some sense of what they're about. So the KP, the planetary K index, that's the KP part of it. That index, it's a, it's a global average. There's no local time or spatial information. It's based on the average of 13 magnetometers, kind of located at mid-latitudes. Um, its main advantage is it's the longest historical record. So if you want to compare something back in time, it's, it's useful for that. It doesn't have a lot of physics in it. It's a three-hour global average. DST, Disturbance Storm Time Index, mainly a measure of the ring current intensity. It's derived from only four low-latitude magnetometers. I mean, that's not many when you consider the size of the Earth. And it is also a global average, so it doesn't give you local time information. And then there's another one called the Auroral Electrojet, which you'll see the AE index. It's uh, based on an average of 12 high-latitude magnetometers um, situated near the auroral zone to try and capture uh, auroral activity. And here are those 13 uh, magnetometers looking down on the pole. And you can see this is an image from, uh, I think this one comes from DE1. Um, of the auroral oval. And so you can see why the magnetometers are located. If you're trying to capture uh, magnetic variability associated with electrical currents flowing in this region here, you'd probably want to have magnetometers here. Now, a magnetometer on the ground is going to respond to any magnetic fluctuation wherever it occurs, whatever generates it. So at best, uh, these stations will capture the, the, the greatest uh, fluctuation from disturbance currents that are closest to their location. So location is everything uh, for, for the formation of these indices. And I think, uh, so these are the electrojets. Uh, uh, somebody mentioned something about electrojets earlier. So there's a, a regular eastward electrojet which flows this way, uh, and it produces a magnetic. If you put your, on the surface of the Earth, so if you curl your, your, uh, your hand, It'll produce a poleward uh, deflection at the surface of the Earth. Over here, we have the westward electrojet. It'll produce an uh, equatorward uh, magnetic deflection. Then we have the so-called substorm electrojet, which will produce an equatorward uh, perturbation as well. And you can think of the sign convention here. At the surface of the Earth, the magnetic field points Earth uh, poleward. It has a component in the poleward direction. So these would be negative relative to that. These would be positive. And so people differentiate AU upper, AL lower, at the envelopes uh, of these deflections. Um, and then AE is the basically the sum of the magnitudes of, of the two. Um, just some jargon that's out there. That, but, but these are measures of, of activity. And the auroral substorm in particular uh, is an event which uh, is, is a feature of the night side uh, reconnection process and the fact that it's very dynamic. And what you see in images for an auroral substorm as it develops is you see a brightening. What's happening is that a lot of uh, electromagnetic power uh, and uh, particle precipitating power is being dumped into the upper atmosphere and it uh, excites the uh, atoms there and causes an emission that you can see from space. Um, and so you see a brightening, and this is, this, this is the feature, typical feature of an auroral substorm. These are 12 minute cadence images, give you a sense of that. And uh, these are all of the observatories for, the, for those three indices. Not a lot of them, magnetic observatories, kind of amazing. OK, um, one of the things that people um, try to do is to say, tell me what the solar wind conditions are in the IMF, and I'd like to be able to predict what kind of activity is going to happen in geospace. You, you know, if you're a space weather forecaster, that might be something useful. And so there are probably 20 different indices that people have proposed. Mine's better than that one, and so on. And um, 
And so this is one that has recently been developed by Pat Newell. So he takes the solar wind velocity, it's dominantly the X component, to the four-thirds power, the total magnetic field strength in the solar wind, and the IMF clock angle theta C. So theta C is the uh, angle of the magnetic field. Northward would be zero. Southward would be 180 in the plane perpendicular to the flow velocity. And you can see that if you're trying to predict KP, uh, at least if you're not trying to predict uh, KP at extremely large values, it actually does a pretty good job. Now, there's another phenomenon. Remember the... Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> wide. Wide. Very wide. Thank you. Right. It's very wide. I, thank you for asking that question, actually. Right, 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 right. Well, this is this is not my plot, but but uh, but there, yeah, it's uh, it's extremely wide, and and that's the problem is that it, it, like statistics, it tells you, you know, some probability, but for any given event, you could be way off. There's no there's no physics here. There there's absolutely no physics. This is an empirical prediction model. Um, another, was there another question? It's data. Yeah, All right. Um, another another uh, very curious feature um, about the interaction between this, the solar wind, magnetosphere, and ionosphere is so-called uh, polar cap uh, potential saturation. So remember the plot of the ionospheric convection patterns, and there's a potential minimum on the dust side and a potential maximum on the dawn side. And if you take the difference between those two, that's called the cross-polar cap potential. And, um, and so this data is from a, a low Earth orbit, DMSP, low Earth orbit satellite, which has a drift meter on it, which can infer the electric fields. And from that, uh, try to back out the uh, potential. So there's a, a kind of a fair amount of uh, averaging that goes on in getting these. But one thing that's seen is, is that as the electric field in the solar wind, B solar wind cross BIMF, um, as that increases, the cross polar cap potential doesn't just keep increasing linearly, it saturates. And that, that last plot that I showed of Newell doesn't go out to the highest KPs because it probably, well, first of all, they're in a lot of events. And second of all, it probably is not doing a very good job there because things aren't linear uh, in that way. Things are a bit more complicated. And in fact, his function isn't linear. It's not just V solar wind cross. It's not the electric field. It's got some more complexity to it to try and uh, optimize uh, the fit. Um, this, uh, those of you who are interested in uh, geospace, this, this is a problem of considerable interest and not one that's fully resolved, although there are a fair number of explanations out there of people who think that they understand it. Uh, geomagnetic storms. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some simulations now from a couple of storms to close out uh, uh, this particular lecture. Um, so there are kind of two flavors of geomagnetic storms, the so-called ICME storm. So this is one which that nice color animation that I showed at the beginning of the CME coming off of the sun going out into the interplanetary medium and interacting with uh, the geomagnetic field. That's a CME-driven storm. Um, then there's another type of storm which is associated with co-rotating interaction regions. So these are structures in the solar wind uh, that rotate. They tend to have a period of 27 days. They recur whenever that feature comes back by. They don't produce as much of a magnet DST signature as the ICME storms, but they tend to last longer, and, and their effects are, are somewhat different. Um, their uh, CMEs are, are episodic. They're not, uh, they're not recurrent. They tend to be much bigger in terms of DSP. Solar energetic protons are more common with the CME storms than with the CIRs. Um, and there are another of other features. Uh, but um, a as with all weather type things, it's, it's not just either or. Things can be quite mixed in some cases. Now, I talked about the importance of ionospheric outflows and the fact that the ionosphere can have a significant effect on the state of the magnetosphere. And to give you one sense of that, um, what's plotted along the horizontal axis here, DST, 
um, going out to minus 400 nanotesla. And then the energy density ratio, so the oxygen to hydrogen or proton dens density ratio in the ring current. Um, now these, the, these points here come from actual in situ satellite data measurements of the particle distribution functions in those regions. And so what you see is that as DST goes up, uh, the ring current tends to have more oxygen in it. And it's not entirely clear what's going on there. It's like, does more oxygen just come out because the system is energized and it feeds into the ring current? Or does the fact that the oxygen's feeding into the ring current make the ring current bigger? It's not, not entirely clear uh, what, what, what the effect is. Um, like, like all such things in, in a system, uh, they're interconnected and everything has to agree to do things in a self-consistent way uh, be before you get the right answer. So um, I'm going to show you a simulation from a CME-driven storm. Uh, th these, uh, what you see here is data from an, uh, a satellite. I think these are, this is from the Omni data set at uh, CEDAW Webb at NASA. Uh, the X component of the interplanetary magnetic field, Y component, Z component, notice that it's strongly negative. This is a CME, uh, magnetic cloud, some people have called it. Uh, has a relatively high density early on, uh, associated with this front moving outward from the sun. Uh, and this is the main phase of the storm as inferred from DST, which I'll show on the next plot. Um, here's KP. So this is March 31st from 2 o'clock until uh, 2 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And you can see that the KP uh, here is uh, quite large uh, during, during this event. So this is a significant storm. Um, here's the auroral electrojet. Um, and you can, auroral electrojet, remember, is a measure of substorm activity. So this is all that dynamic stuff that's going on in the tail. And, um, and so it started to kick up on the 31st, uh, but it lasted for several days. A lot of activity going on here. Okay, so now um, let's, uh, let's take a look here at a result from a simulation. So the main phase, again, is color-coded yellow. Um, these points right here, these diamonds, are the actual DST that you can get from Kyoto, uh, from the uh, website at Kyoto. You can go there and get in less than five minutes for any given time interval, practically. Um, the DST value. So this is what was actually measured. These are, this is from a simulation by Alex Glosser in 2009 using the BATS-RS, uh, Global Simulation Code at the University of Michigan. I think they now call, prefer to call it the Space Weather Modeling Framework. Um, and he did uh, uh, an experiment here. He did a simulation when he did not include any ex outflow of oxygen from the ionosphere. And the DST value that he got uh, from that simulation, and he actually goes in and does a proxy for DST by, re by measuring actually the magnetic uh, perturbations at the center of the Earth, which is a, a reasonable facsimile for DST. And then when he put oxygen in, he got much better agreement, not, you know, depends on whether you're trying to forecast uh, weather or see what your physics is doing. Not bad for physics, still not that great for weather. Uh, early on, it did a good job, and it, and it definitely got down low enough, but the, the model, the outflow model, is not that great. Um, the cross-polar cap potential also changed significantly. This is down in the ionosphere now um, due to the uh, inclusion of outflow. So no outflow is the red curve. Uh, there's an empirical model, a data simulation model called AMI. It's the dashed lines here. You can see that with no outflow, the cross-polar cap potential is far too large. Um, with outflow, it pulls it down. It brings it at least more into line with what Amy would predict. And one interpretation of why that occurs is because the ring current, which is enhanced due to the pressure, presence of oxygen, tends to inflate the magnetosphere on the outside of the ring current. That tends to change the shape of the boundary, changes the shape of the magnetosheath flow around the boundary. Um, and therefore the reconnection that occurs at the dayside boundary. So it's a very interesting uh, and not yet fully understood uh, interaction. Uh, the, last, uh, the last thing I'd like to show is uh, this fascinating phenomenon which has come to be called the uh, sawtooth event. Uh, 
So um, for almost steady solar wind conditions, um, it was discovered about 30 years ago that started to be discovered and more, more data was brought to bear to resolve it, that the magnetosphere just kind of has this kind of three hour time scale oscillation that occurs even though the solar wind's steady. And um, you can almost think of it if you, if you think in terms of nonlinear dynamics as a relaxation oscillation. And what you see in this plot here is some data from uh, LANL satellites, um, uh, three different LANL satellites, top, middle, and bottom panel, uh, located at different points, geosynchronous satellites are located at different points. And this satellite is at noon at this point, at local midnight, this one's at local midnight at this point, and this one's at local noon at this point right here. Um, and you see that uh, almost regardless of where the satellites are, so it's almost a, a planetary scale oscillation that's occurring. Um, geostationary, 6.6 RE, but this is occurring even further out. And you see this, these are fluxes. So the satellite's sitting there and it sees these intense fluxes of particles on, their, on the particle detectors coming up and then it subsides and then three hours later, uh, approximately, another one occurs. Uh, and this, this event occurred over a period of about 24 hours. It's, it's the best studied sawtooth event. And, and these particle fluxes, the interpretation is that you have reconnection occurring in the magnetotope. You have a substorm going. When the rubber band snaps, the particles are pulled earthward, betatron accelerate, pumped up in energy, LANL satellite de particle detector see that. So that's what, that's what LANL is seeing, and that's the interpretation of why it's seeing that. Now, Another approach, so another uh, global simulation, this one, the LFM model. And by the way, let me just, since there's a little bit of pedagogy here, let me just talk about how you turn an MHD, set of MHD equations into a magnetosphere. The, both, both the space weather modeling framework at the, at the most primitive level in LFM are just solving the equations of ideal MHD. How does it get to be a magnetosphere? S several things. One, put a point dipole at the center of the Earth, uh, an ideal magnetic point dipole to represent the geomagnetic field. Um, so, then, so now you got a geomagnetic field. Give an upstream boundary condition to represent the flow of solar wind plasma and interplanetary magnetic field interacting with that region. Include a low altitude boundary condition that represents the conducting ionosphere. The fields are, field lines are anchored in that conducting ionosphere. And then go one level higher and now start allowing mass exchange. This is this mass outflow. And that's, that's the hardest thing to do and the least well understood of, of the, the various things. But once you do that, and then you turn on that upstream boundary condition to represent the solar wind, it turns the system into a magnetosphere for you, if your numerics are reasonably good. And so, um, so what this, this particular event, so this is this April 18, 2002 sawtooth event again. And the gray area here are from geotail measurements. So geotail sitting up in the magnetic lobes. And it's seeing variations in the magnetic flux there. And, uh, and they infer uh, this periodicity based on those measurements. Um, when Oliver, who's a former student of mine, uh, ran a simulation, the LFM simulation with no outflow, um, it gets the first variation reasonably well, but then kind of set, settles into what's called a steady magnetospheric convection state. It's not truly steady, but it's not as variable as, as what you see here. Then he puts, uh, then he allows outflow, causally regulated outflow, regulated in, in the sense that what, what, what we did was extract from the simulation bandpass filtered pointing flux going downward that was in approximately in the band of Alfane waves and used an empirical formula to specify how much outflow should come out for a given amount of flux in. So wherever and whenever that electromagnetic power went in, outflow would come out. It's a poor man's uh, way of doing transport. And um, this was the, the, a simulation. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah, you don't you don't tend to see sawtooth in CIR. They're they're much more variable. The solar winds much more turbulent uh, in CIR interactions regions. Um, we have simulated uh, CIR driven storms with and without outflow to get a sense of what's going on there. And what we see is that the substorms actually there's a catalog of sawtooth substorms that's available out there if you look hard enough. And that catalog is kind of got apples and oranges in it, in the sense that some of the sawtooth events in that catalog are actually triggered by something in the solar wind. And others, like this one, have some sort of internal dynamic which has nothing to do with the solar wind uh, uh, variability. And so what, what we find when we include oxygen for CIR storms is that the timing of the, saw, of the substorm uh, has very little to do with the, whether oxygen is present or not. But the intensity of the substorm changes if you include oxygen. And the reason is that when the substorm occurs in the CIR driven substorms, uh, it's the external driving trigger in the solar wind that's stimulating the substorm, not an internal dynamic. Is that okay? So I'm, I'm not showing a CIR driven storm. They're not quite as interesting as the CME driven ones. Okay, and so what, what you see here, this is a simulation color uh, here um, in this little inset is, is the outflow flux. So it's causally regulated. So you can see it's by no means coming out in one place at one time. Um, and then the, in the bigger picture here, this is log de ion density. And note that the green color is like one, is one, 10 to the zero. So that would be one per cc. Uh, so you can see that the magnetic uh, magnetosphere is very tenuous compared to the solar wind here. And what you see, these are actually the observed timings, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, of the actual uh, sawtooth substorms. The simulation doesn't get the exact timing right, but it does get the periodicity about right uh, in these things. And what happens when, when one of them occurs, so let's just see if we can, oh, it stopped. Um, what happens is that uh, you see a, a plasmoid being ejected down tail after that substorm in a contraction of the near Earth region. Okay, so um, this is my last slide, and then I'll close with a, a few things to leave you with. Um, so this substorm outflow cycle that leads to this kind of periodicity, which is kind of intriguing, the the what happens is that the ions that come up out of the ionosphere, they're these lumbering things. They, they start out slow. And it takes them at least 30 minutes, if not an hour, to go from the ionosphere to the magnetotail, to the plasma sheet. So even though they might have an effect, it's going to be delayed. There's a lot of latent, latency in, in the interaction involving ions. Um, so if we go around this cycle here, and let's, uh, why don't we start here? So Suppose we have a substorm that goes off in the magneto tail, and that rubber band snaps. The magnetic field lines go earthward, and all of this alphanic power is, is sent down to the ionosphere. Okay? So alphanic power flows earthward. It hits the ionosphere. The ions start getting energized, perpendicular, the oxygen perpendicular. Mirror force lifts them up. They head tailward. Um, they reach the plasma sheet. Uh, it starts, they, they continue to accumulate there and they kind of stress the magnetic field out there, stretches it tailward. It breaks magnetotail instability. You get a magnetic dipolarization. Dipolarization means the field becomes more dipole like as opposed to stretched like. Alphanic power goes earthward and the cycle starts over and over again. That's what we think is the origin of the uh, sawtooth oscillation. More the pressure. The, the oxygen, actually, and there have been, this is not just simulation business, there has been some work done by Lynn Kistler using uh, the cluster satellite data. These are four satellites, relatively close orbit, that they're actually in uh, ecliptic, not ecliptic, uh, meridional orbits, but they do pass through the plasma sheet. And she's used that data to try and infer the extent to which the oxygen is supporting the current in the magneto tail. Um, and, it, and, it, and it doesn't seem, that the oxygen doesn't seem to be carrying a lot of current. One of the things that oxygen does is it changes the alphane speed. 
you know, phase speed goes like one over the square root of the mass. So if you increase, if you add more heavy ions, oxygen 16 times heavier than protons, then you're dropping the L phase. If it were 100% oxygen, you'd drop the L phase speed by a factor of four, everything else being the same. The reconnection rate scales with the L phase speed. So if you add a lot of oxygen, you slow down reconnection. The day side keeps adding all this flux over the polar cap, and the, and the night side, reconnection is slowing down. It goes into crisis mode at some point. It, I mean, it's, all this flux is accumulating at some point, and this, this episodic thing happens. OK, last slide. <clears throat> Key points. Um, magne magnetospheric structure and current systems, it's, it's robust. So some of the things I talked about early on, those features, the shock, the magnetopause, the current systems we see, those are robust features, but there's a lot of variability in them. Um, energy and momentum are most effectively transferred from the solar wind to, the, to geospace by the reconnection process. There is a viscous interaction there. Um, in the early, early, early days of magnetospheric physics, people thought it was the viscous interaction, Axford and Hines, until Dungey came along. And, um, and the thought about the viscous interaction is that you get all of this turbulence, Kelvin-Helmholtz, at the boundaries of the magnetosphere. And that turbulence starts to entrain some of the internal plasma uh, to move tailward with the same, with, in the direction of the magnetosheath velocity. That's an anomalous viscosity. It's all collisionless physics going on here. Uh, but uh, what people have been able to determine is, is that the amount of the cross-polar cap potential that's due to the viscous interaction is maybe 10% at most. So it's, it's a small, much smaller effect. Yeah? Yeah, I, I don't know that, but I, it, I, I could accept that you have some better knowledge than I on that point. <laughs> Is that? Yeah. Oh, would it be more of a... Well, I, I don't... I mean, the system is going to be more, more disturbed, stirred up, uh, say, uh, variable during CIR interactions, but I think it's still fair to say that the reconnection process is, is the dominant mode in which the solar wind imparts its energy and momentum to geospace. Um, and the cross-polar cap potential is still significant during CIR storms. DST, the ring current, hasn't built up much, but the cross-polar cap potential hasn't gone down to like 10 or 20 kilovolts. It's still up around 100. So that would be my answer. I, but I haven't, I haven't really studied the uh, uh, correlations uh, between these various things. Um, so magnetospheric activity, as John Foster will tell you a lot more tomorrow, I believe, uh, uh, exhibits a lot of variability that seems to be very closely connected with the solar cycle and semi-annual variations. Um, solar and interplanetary variability stimulate magnetospheric activity. The, the magnetosphere... Um, is driven, actually almost everything that you see in the magnetosphere is weather. It's not season. The season is back at the sun, or the climate is back at the sun, and the magnetosphere is responding to what the sun does. So it's more like it's weather happening today. Um, however, to the extent that the atmosphere has some sort of climate variability in their uh, Work has been done to ask sort of paleomagnetospheric physics. So you could ask the question, when the Earth's dipole field reversed, what did the magnetosphere look like then? And there have been some interesting studies on that. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good. And, uh, and the variability, we, there, there's uh, some fascinating things that are going on in, in the geospace system um, that cannot be explained totally in terms of external driving. I mean, the external driver imparts the power, but the dynamic that we see, the, the magnetosphere has some of its own internal dynamics that are really fascinating. <clears throat> 
And so with that, um, I hope the lab, what are you going to cover in the lab? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Actually, uh, I'm not, and I apologize for that. My wife and I scheduled an extended weekend in Telluride um, starting this afternoon. <laughs> I'll stay around. I'll stay around until the questions subside and, and the lab starts up. Uh, I appreciate your attention. It's, it's amazing how diverse you all are. And, um, I'm sure that the people here who are interested in geospace go like, yeah, this is great, and then the sun, well, you know, and vice versa. And then astro, you know, astro is even like a whole, a whole different level, but uh, uh, it's great. I went, to, I went to some summer schools like this when I was a graduate student in ancient history. Um, and they were very, yeah, <laughs> they were very gr uh, good experiences for me. I hope you have the same. Yes. Yes. Well, there—I mean, there are. I—I didn't—I didn't dwell on this, but uh, let me let me go back to this one picture just to—I'll put it on while I'm talking. Uh, this one. The upper left there, you can see this is a, an image, kind of from when the satellite's down near the equatorial plane, and it can you kind of get a sense that you can see the aurora in both hemispheres. But you're not looking down on the top, so you don't really know how conjugate they are. And that's part of the problem. But for, for the purposes of particle precipitation, you you know if you go out into to the magneto tail or the plasma sheet, I mean, you know if particles are originating in the equatorial magnetosphere, they ought to go into the two more or less conjugate. However, um, you know I mean things that do change. Uh, so for example, um, what happens in the in the dark hemisphere? Say, so now we're in a solstice condition. And in the dark ionosphere, um, less of the ionospheric charged particles have made its way up to low altitude. And at, at altitudes of about Earth, one Earth radius above the auroral zone, um, the plasma starved for charge carriers. There just aren't enough charges there. And, and uh, so, so, charges, so charge density builds up. Parallel electric fields are established. And they accelerate the particles to, to uh, ameliorate the fact that there aren't enough carriers. So there are two ways to enhance the current, more carriers or faster carriers. So the parallel electric field makes faster carriers. And so in the dark hemisphere, there are actually indications that that type of precipitation 
is more enhanced in the dark hemisphere than the bright hemisphere. So they're, even though things start symmetric from the equatorial plane when they get down to low altitudes, things, things can become quite different. So, yeah, please. Yeah. Right, right. The tail was moving around, or moving up and down significantly. And uh, the IMF is a, is a big factor in changing the location of the magneto tail. There is a little bit of, uh, of uh, and I, I don't think I have the solar wind velocity components here, but it, you know, there is some variability there which will affect things to some extent. There's also, over this, this is 24 hours, and so there's a, so the dipole tilt is taking into account. Some of the first results I showed, remember the, the J dot E in the equatorial plane early on, that was for a dipole perfectly oriented with the spin axis, okay, for simplicity. This one has the dipole tilt in it, and so that will also give some wobbling of, of near Earth. The equatorial plane is going to, uh, the magnetic equatorial plane is going to be wobbling, and some of that finds its way into the magneto tail as well.